All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Carrie McDaniel Burnish. Uh, we're in Dundee. It's October 28th, 2021. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, first and biggest question is why wine? Why wine? Because when I was a four year old uh, little girl, David Lett showed up on my father's doorstep at the Granary District in McMinnville. And um, my father became intrigued with wine and uh, as a result of David showing up on his doorstep, the owner of Irie, and David's first and still the winery today that the Lett family is in was actually rented to him and then purchased by the Lett family uh, that same year, 1969. So that precipitated my father's interest in grapes and a desire to move out of McMinnville where he was running the granary and purchase three pieces of acreage in the Dundee Hills and plant vineyards on all three and build a house on one as well. So I was basically um, raised along with the grapes. So <laughs> I'm not sure that I ever really chose a career in the wine industry, but it just sort of happened that way. Tell me about some of your kind of earliest memories of that, of the wine industry or of the grapes. So what, what do you remember from those days? My very earliest memory is actually David Lett's winery as he was setting it up. Um, my father bought me hip waders that went, well, they, were, they went a little past my knees. <laughs> and because there was electrical cords strewn all over the floor and uh, lots of water, obviously, and so that's involved in the whole winemaking process. and. And that was an uh, that was my very first memory, and uh, lots of memories. I'd walk down from my dad's granary after school, and go just kind of be in David Lett's winery. So those are my earliest memories: bringing the grapes in, watching them bring the grapes in, and watching the fruit flies, and so and the smell. And I think now that I'm a wine judge, I can look back and I can really credit. Um, I, that sensory experience to just those early smells of what a fresh grape tasted like, what, a, what it smelled like. Um, because, you know, wine in general is a sensory experience and textural and sensual. So anyway. So with the vineyard specifically, tell me about watching them kind of grow up. You've mentioned kind of growing up along with you. Right. Tell me about, tell me about that. Right. Well, um, we actually planted the vineyard and, and moved to the Dundee Hills when I was uh, six years old. And it was an interesting process that first fall on the hill. We had two travel trailers and we lived in those where we were actually digging a foundation and um, building the house. So as you can imagine, um, two travel trailers up in the windy hill in about November um, it was an interesting experience. And then planting the cuttings um, at the same time and a lot of mud, a lot of red dirt. And uh, so I, the vineyard did mature and so did I. Um, I, we made it through, we built the house, got the vineyard planted, had our first harvest in 1976. Um, planted the vineyard obviously in 1972, so 76 was the first harvest. And uh, I grew up along with the vineyard. Mm -hmm. Did you, at what point did you think you might stick with wine? Was it something you grew up kind of resenting or did you enjoy the process? Well, initially, I'm moving from the big town of McMinnville to the hills of Dundee was a little bit of a shock and there was no sidewalks. You know, I couldn't ride a bike. I mean, I could ride a bike, but it was on gravel going down steep hills. So it was a different concept for a child. Um, it, it was a marvelous experience that I got over resenting after about maybe the first, I don't know, month. You could ask my mother, she might say it took about a half a year, but um, anyway. I got over it and I really realized that although it didn't hold the same connotations that it did for adults who sort of might envision that that was a big romantic experience you know you languished on the deck with your wine glass at harvest and I learned nobody languishes at harvest with a wine glass but um, I, it became really part of my soul and I'm grateful that I had that experience and I did take it into my career um, my early career as a journalist, um, it kept drawing me back all of the stories that I, you know, wanting to tell those stories to another generation. So I took my career in journalism and decided that I was going to write my first book about those stories. 
Well, before we get to that, let's back up a second here. So as you're, as you're considering, as you're, as you're in high school, you're kind of considering what to right. do next. Tell me about that decision and, and what you were thinking at that point for your kind of life ahead. Well, um, what I was thinking was that I was going to go be a newspaper reporter, an international correspondent. So I went to University of Oregon and with a, a burning desire to go be a you know newspaper correspondent just as the advent of newspaper the advent of the internet um, at u of o my senior year we got the first macintosh computer lab <laughs> so i'm dating myself but um that yeah, anyway so long story short uh the technology i think at that time uh, versus the technology now, but we can go into that more later. Anyway, so at that time when I was in college, I decided, wow, you know, um, even as a college person, I started going to the, um, I'd come home and I'd go to the hill parties and harvest parties because our neighborhood on Warden Hill Road, we were all friends. And we still all had potlucks and community parties together. And I'd go and I'd listen to everybody in the room, all the growers, Jim Marsh, Arthur Weber, uh, Bill Archibald, Dickie Rath, and their wives, I always like to point that out, my mother, Donna Jean, and um, the Ponzi's, Dick and Nancy. And there's, uh, everybody in the room would be telling these stories and laughing and it was a common experience that we all had had for that last 15 years that we had actually made these grapes grow um, and and there was already stories even in the 80s the stories of us in the 70s and and so i just took that you know my journalism and writing love i guess and turned it into my first book vineyard memoirs <clears throat> Even though I never really set out deliberately to have a career in the wine world, my writing and my wine experience sort of melded. And What was it about the stories particularly that, that sort of drew you in? What made you need to write them? I wanted to really, number one, um, I wanted to honor the people that had made these endeavors uh, possible and establish the first generation of the wine industry so everybody that came, the next wave that came in the mid 80s, uh, Joseph Durhan and Rollins Souls with Argyle, they had something to build on because we were our humble little growers in the hills and there was a fledgling industry. And so it made me want to um, honor their stories and, mm -hmm. and my own with my parents and um, because it was a challenge. It was not, it was not, <clears throat> it was glorious and it was beautiful in many ways, scenically beautiful and um, communally, really it was, an, it, it was a great experience too. We collaborated, but it was also very challenging mm -hmm. in sometimes. We had um, most of the 70s, a lot of those harvests were just so rainy and because of climate change, they were a little later. And so I remember harvesting once at Halloween, rain pouring down. Our neighbor, Sally Bowers, who is John Bowers, which is um, now partially owned by Winderley. Mm -hmm. Actually, all they live in the Winderley house. Um, they live in the Bower house. Um, Sally Bowers talks about being in her Bronco at the top of the, our vineyard but, that we sold to them. And, basically putting the brakes, trying to put the brakes on and sliding halfway down the vineyard and then finally coming to a stop, almost, you know, going over the hill into the road and it, that's what it was like. It was kind of the Wild West. I mean, once we made, we made, we had pickers, we had a whole volunteer crew for harvest and we had no, nobody brought raincoats or even thought about it and it was just pouring down rain. So we got those black garbage bags out and made holes in the bottom and made garbage bag poncho raincoats. <laughs> so, use what you have, right? Use, what, use, use, what, use what what's had. available. Right, right. And my dad had a lot of equipment at the granary, flatbed trucks, <clears throat> things like that that came in very handy. Um, but you know, we, we used twisties from glad bags to tie the grapes. I mean, those little twisties that you used to close the bag with before they had the easy close. Anyway, so that was my job. I would tie the grapes, I'd go down and I'd take my little twisty and I'd take the vine and then I'd twist it to the, to the wire. So, you know, we were not highly mechanized. <laughs> My dad had a tractor. He had, we called it, the, it was a caterpillar. 
um, tractor, so it was a crawler, mm -hmm. uh, because that's in Italy we sort of, we really observed what they were doing in other countries that already had been hundreds of years established in the industry. And so he decided it would be a great idea to get a, what we call the, the caterpillar, the cat, the crawler. The only thing was it didn't have the best brakes. And so um, uh, one day he was going down the row and he put his foot on the brake and it was just barely stopping. And um, so he thought, well, you know, I'm aimed at least this way. There's some woods over there. And he shot out of the vineyard and then came to a, finally came to a stop right at the edge of a very large tree. So, yeah, so we, yeah. Lamborghini sports tractor. Yeah. Yes, and actually that was the Lamborghini sports tractor. We called it a sports tractor. It was a Lamborghini. <laughs> <laughs> so. Everybody grows up dreaming of having a Lamborghini. Right, right, right. He'd right. say my Lamborghini. Right, yeah. So, so, so with, the, with the first book, tell me about the sort of the, the challenges for you. Obviously, it's an important story near and dear to you, but you also kind of grew up in it. So t tell me about the challenge of trying to get other people's stories and, and tell them in the way you wanted to tell them. Uh, well, it was a challenge because everybody had a different opinion about the same event. So I, I, would, I started tape recording them. I got a little handheld tape recorder. Uh, when I really first started recording the stories so that I would actually have a verbal uh, dialogue to write from. And I really, I got pictures from people because that was helpful when I was writing my first book, Vineyard Memoirs. Uh, people were willing to come forth with their story because they had been part of my childhood, so they were comfortable talking to me. Mm -hmm. And then there's always the story that I can't write, which is the story about people that nobody really, you know, I know too much about. Everybody knows too much about each other once you've grown up in the same neighborhood. And they trusted me that I would write a, a story that was, you know, respectful. <laughs> so I'd leave that to somebody else to write one that's not. So what came next for you after, after working on that book? What say what, what, what came next for you? What was what, what happened well, next? I I wrote that was my first one, um, and then I ended up going to work for Mr. Smith at Evergreen Aviation, and Laurent Montlou was the winemaker that we hired to establish his marketing program right there in front of the Spruce Goose, and Mr. Smith decided. Well, Laurent made wonderful wine, um, and. Um, even though that vineyard was challenged because the AV, it's the negative zero elevation. Mm -hmm. um, but we did pull in grapes from other vineyards, so that made it better. Um, so long story short, Mr. Smith decided that it would be a good idea to take his organ wine with the spruce goose on the label that his son Mike had brought, who was actually a childhood friend of mine. Um, he decided to, that, oh, let's just take this to China. So, you know, when you have a plane, you can just fire it up and then you put your wine in the plane and you go to China. And that was so what I did. And uh, Paris, I went to the Paris Air Show and represented Evergreen. Well, we had a trade booth there because we had the cargo section of Evergreen. And then they had me over in the corner with my little podium <laughs> giving people tastes of wine. <laughs> Well, they were at this air show, and we were an interesting combination, the cargo and the, the wine, but you know, it, we were diverse, and um, that was a wild experience, and really just a really very, very good experience, and um, I had a lot of support from Laurent Montelieu um, helping me <clears throat> learn the ropes in how to sell wine, mm -hmm. and of course it was a little challenging because I, I I took French and I can, I can understand French, but my speaking is ex incredibly limited in that department. However, wine is a universal, you know, sort of commonality. So um, that, was, that was great, it was fun. Mm -hmm. And also I went to Taiwan and that was a really fascinating experience too with the wine and I went to Shanghai to the Bund, which is, um, it's a really wonderful historical district in Shanghai that's now been renovated into a, in a really um, high-end food and wine mm -hmm. district and um, actually sold the wine at the restaurants in there and the Cliff, which is a hotel in, in Hong Kong. Uh, this was, that particular one was on an Oregon Wine Board trade mission. 
and I went with Doyle Hinman, um, Hinman Vineyards, um, who actually had been one of the people who had purchased our grapes mm -hmm. very, very back in the 70s. I'd known Doyle for a long time. And um, Myron Redford's um, sales rep was mm -hmm. there too. So we had Amity and we had Hinman, and then I was representing Evergreen and or a couple other people, wineries there too. But so those were always a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Those first early Oregon wine board trips, or Oregon wine. They, it was still Oregon Wine Growers Association. The Oregon Wine Marketing Board had just been created. They were sort of, you know, trying to be separate and mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. starting out. Yeah. So I'm curious, first of all, about the challenges of selling wine. You're learning, to, like I say, learning the ropes of selling wine. What what is what what is difficult about selling wine, and what is what is easy about selling wine? Well, it's difficult selling wine in foreign countries for obvious reasons that you have a language barrier, um, and it, it was difficult because there, all of well, many countries, particularly France. Um, had been doing it for so long in an established marketplace that when I was in China, French wine was being, was permeated the market and also Australian wine was in China too. Um, and Australia sometimes was not high end and so they would, there was, it was really a better price, mm -hmm. much better price than I could sell a bottle of Oregon Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. So again, I had to figure out how I was going to effectively sell this bottle of wine when I was being undercut by you know these other places who were much more established than I was, and some had much better price point because Oregon Pinot Noir, you know, it it, it costs a certain amount to produce a, a, a distinct Pinot Noir, and uh, anyway, uh, so one of the things that I discovered really is the way to sell a bottle of wine really effectively is you you treat the person that you're talking to about the bottle of wine, you don't just try to say, you don't, you don't even talk about how much it costs. You know, you ask them, um, you know, about themselves and you have a conversation with them just as you would treat them as a person. You don't treat it as a sales conversation. So, um, that seemed to work when I just said, hello, how are you today? And nice to see you and what do you do? And try to draw them out and have them at least share some sort of what their wine experience was, mm -hmm. you know, why they, you know, what they're interested in with this bottle of wine. And, and eventually I'd be, I was able to make people relaxed um, enough to be interested in wanting to hearing the story behind the bottle of wine and that made them interested. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon before they knew it, they were buying a bottle of wine. Tell me about the what Oregon's wine reputation was at that time. Did, had anybody Zero. heard of it? <laughs> well, no, I take that back. I, I to give Doyle Hinman credit. He'd been there the year before, and Myron Redford to mm -hmm. give them both credit. Um, they had been there the year before, and so and to Japan too. I was not on that part of the trade trip, but um, and also the Ponzi's had navigated the market early on too. Um, anyway. So it wasn't exactly, I wasn't exactly number, I mean, there'd been a few forays into the market, mm -hmm. but um, it was not very, it, there was not very many people in the game at that point. What was the reaction to the wine? I mean, there was not many people in the Oregon market. Sure. There was California had already started sure. to do that. What was the reaction? In I'm, the, I'm curious, what, when people did try the wine, what did they think of the Oregon wine? What, where? When, in, when, you, when, you, when you're selling it in foreign countries, did, did people appreciate it? Well, um, when I was pouring it in at the Paris Air Show, that was perhaps the most difficult because I am holding myself to a high standard with these people who have grown up literally with this outstanding world-class wine. So selling Pinot Noir to French people was a little difficult. <laughs> I'm not going to, I mean, but, but the one thing I did, and I was very clear, I said, you know, we're cold climate growers just like you are, and but it does have a taste that's different just because it's a different dirt. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what I named my second book, Dirt Vine Wine, because everything really in a wine bottle, when you're telling the wine story, emanates from talking about the dirt. Mm -hmm. And everybody universally, somehow it all comes back to having a conversation about what kind of dirt the vine is planted in. So that's why I called my second book Dirt Vine Wine, but I'm regressing, but anyway. <laughs> 
Well, I know we're going to get to Dirt Vine Wine, but so, so tell me kind of after working with Evergreen, what did you do next? Um, after working with Evergreen, I, I then had three children, the youngest being one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was a mom for a while, mm -hmm. and, um, and I did that. And then I, well, we moved to we moved to Ashland for three years because my husband worked for the um, moved worked for a company down there. So I got to experience the Southern Oregon wine industry. Mm. That was nice mm -hmm. for three years. And then we moved back here, and then I decided it was time to write my second book. And what was the impetus? For, you mentioned dirt. So tell me about that and about what the kind of the goal for the second book was. Well, the goal for the second book, actually, so after we moved back from Ashland, I went back to where I, I guess I left this caveat out. Um, right after college, I had gone to, and worked for Argyle. Rollins Souls made his first vintage in our basement. And his friends, Ken Wright and, and Alan Holstein and Ken Wright had just come from Kentucky. And by way of being, they worked in the restaurant industry in San Francisco, and you've heard these stories too. But so Ken and Alan came, and Alan ended up being our vineyard manager, and then Rollin came, and he started making wine in our basement too, pre Argyle. <laughs> and um, so Rollin decided that it would be a good idea to take me down to the tasting room and at Argyle, Argyle's first tasting room, and explain, you know, that I. My job was to basically be in the tasting room, one of the first tasting room staff, and have people pronounce Pinot Noir correctly, and introduce what was to be after, well, Fred Arterberry was technically Oregon's first sparkling wine and a very gifted um, winemaker. But um, Rollin definitely put sparkling wine on the board for Oregon and his uh, collaboration with the Knutson family still that exists today, as you know. Um, so I had the rare opportunity to promote the classic Argyle Brut, which is still, you know, being produced today. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a real game changer and a really exciting thing. So anyway, when I came back from Ashland um, in, um, I, and I had these three children, and I thought, well, my father was already working at Argyle because we had sold the vineyard and the winery by that point. Um, I talked to Brolin again. He's like, well, why don't you just come on back and have, you know, take two at Argyle. So I did. And so that was great too. You know, that was a real fun, that was a real fun period in my life. And that was the impetus for me starting to write Dirt Plus Vine Equals Wine because I thought, wait, here we are, you know, we're, it was a decade later from when I had written Vineyard Memoirs. And I thought, well, now we have we have the impetus of these other wineries and we have a whole second generation going here and so it's time to document the second generation what was what had changed in the, that time in terms of what you were writing about how, how much had the industry changed and how much did you need to change what you were writing about well it it, it changed and it didn't i mean the, the fundamentals of the industry um that make the Oregon wine industry unique were still there and they're still there today, which is wonderful, which is they are founded by people, not corporations. Um, so many of the families that did found those wineries are entering their 50th year. We can get more to that later. But, um, but at that time, um, after that, of course, as you know, these families still own these vineyards and, and some wineries. Um, but now there was backing from corporations coming in and working with the families to develop them in a mm -hmm. in an authentic way and so that's what was different and Rowan had investors with argyle as you know mm -hmm. all of those things so he was able to go to the growers and um you know facilitate relationships with growers because he had the corporate backing of these different investors and really expand on our original vision you know, of you know, producing not only still wonderful Pinot Noir, but sparkling wine too. So, mm -hmm. and many people did that. Rex Hill, Paul Hart at Rex Hill, um, was maybe one of the first who actually made the concept, who developed the concept of having being a, um, a vineyard management company, mm -hmm. and 
he managed, or Lynn Penarash, <clears throat> and along with Paul Hart managing the vineyards of um, Archibald, um, Jim Marsh, although um, they didn't ever manage the vineyard, but they made their wine. Mm -hmm. And so he would make, on Rex Hill, he would make subtitle, the labels would be, Paul, uh, would be Rex Hill and then Marsh Vineyard, or Rex Hill and Archibald Vineyard. So he supported the growers and put their individual names on the labels, which was a significant turn of events for us because before that everybody had had to just produce their own wine and put their own name on the label. And now there was opportunities to work with bigger entities where the winery could actually mm -hmm. showcase the growers' names. Mm -hmm. And Lynn Penner Ash made, as you know, the wine with Rex Hill in those early years and, and worked very closely with those, well, with us, the growers in the hills. Mm -hmm. And I worked with her at Rex Hill too. So during the, I would go back and forth between Argyle and Rex Hill in those early days. And I mean, at the same time, basically, those were my two running to the two tasting rooms thinking I'm crazy, but you know, <laughs> I just graduated from college, so whatever. Um, so that was an interesting place to be in the mid 80s. <clears throat> And the dynamic from the 70s when we were all just these growers selling our tonnage basically to Dick Erath and you only skip ahead a decade more and then you are in the 80s and we already have these corporate entities and Joseph Durhan and the, the French connection and um, there was a significant difference even in 10 years. And then you jump of course ahead to another 10, another 20 and where we are today and there's significant difference. Not only to mention significant difference in technology. We had a phone pole when we were first building our property in Dundee. We strung the phone line from the phone pole at the end of the driveway and put a pole in the ground and then attached the phone to it while we were building our house. I mean, and dug the well and right there, there was the pump house and the phone pole and the vineyard. Uh, so, and technology clearly has changed. You know, I had a turntable up there at the vineyard and records, and of course I, my siblings' records were more interesting than mine, but, um, and now, you know, look at, we have Macintosh laptops and I'm streaming videos of, you know, the vineyard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So technologically, obviously, much has changed. But um, those are universal connectors too. Now, um, the phone was basically the universal connector then. So um, I think one of the major things that is connecting us now and will connect us into the future too is the accessibility now that people have to enter our lives. We were, I don't want to use the word insular, but we were isolated to a certain extent. It doesn't seem that far up there now, but I mean, there was an isolation factor with that. And uh, so people had to make a deliberate effort to come out to visit the tasting rooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Martha Marsh was Jim, was um, Dickie Rath's first tasting room manager. And she put a card table out. You've probably heard this story, you know, she put a card table out in the garage at Dick's, which is now Knutson. And, um, <laughs> opened the garage door with her table and stood there and wondered if anybody was going to come. You know, I mean, we don't have those same worries anymore. But anyway, mm -hmm. the, the internet has definitely been the great equalizer in terms of making people more a part of the growing experience and the winery experience. Mm -hmm. And now even to the point that it's interactive where you can obviously like talk is the universal reservation system now where you can go make a reservation online. Mm -hmm. You don't have to even call the winery anymore. Mm -hmm. So what used to be the, the common denominator was everything was connected by the phone. Now it's connected by the computer. Mm -hmm. so and you have an old phone. You have Nancy Ponzi's phone in the archive. I've seen it. I love Ponzi's it. Nancy phone, yes. yes. And an old radio as well. It's great, yeah. great stuff. Um, so tell me about with Dirt Post Vine Equals Wine, um, were there other sort of revelations you had as you were working on that book uh, of the things that had changed in the industry or of the things that had stayed the same as you were working on that book? 
Yes, one of the things that really had changed is the amount of people that are in Dundee now versus when we were there, there were 400 people, there was no stoplight, it was a speed trap, which I know the people going through there now can hardly believe it was a speed trap because we had to build a bypass now for all of the cars. So. The infrastructure here was was minimal at best. There was a truck stop, you know, I mean, called the Nighthawk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the uh, growth of the industry, just the people moving to the to Dundee, number one. I think it's five thousand people now versus four hundred mm -hmm. in the early seventies. So. <clears throat> There's, that's one big, huge difference. Mm -hmm. Another difference is, I think people are more aware of Oregon wine now. In, I mean, I know people are more aware and very supportive of Oregon wine. We have organizations like Travel Oregon, which has been just a, a great support for the industry and, and countless you know, hotels, the, the um, restaurant and hotel industry mm. has been really the rise of the restaurant and the hotel industry has, has gone along with the rise of Oregon wine and there's been wonderful synergy. Not only do we have collaboration with each other in the early days, those stories that you've heard, which are true, um, we've also had that kind of collaboration with the restaurant and the hotel industry too, because they're all one big, you know, we all are in the same food chain, so to speak. So from that book then? So that you look at the restaurant industry in Dundee, yeah. um, there was the restaurant industry, interestingly, was, well, Tina's came in in the 80s, mm -hmm. but previous to that, there was, um, Alice's Diner, you know, and so now you look at the restaurants now and it's just, you know, there's wonderful restaurants all around in Dundee. Anyway. I, oh, no, no, yes, it's, it is. It's, it's amazing to think of it not having any hospitality part of the industry in Dundee, oh, yeah. given what's there now, like given what's, what's there now. We had to coming. go to Portland. <laughs> we, we went to Portland. I mean, we, that's where everybody went to. We sold our wine in Portland and mm -hmm. established the first wine store, you know, relationships. And, mm -hmm. And then Nick's, of course, in McMinnville. He was the pioneer of pulling in those first, our first bottles of wine and selling them and really being a big promoter. Mm -hmm. And I think that IPNC emanated from part of that too, from that hospitality of McMinnville was a mm -hmm. early, those Nick and others in McMinnville, obviously the Let's being in McMinnville and mm -hmm. um, David and Diana. Uh, worked a lot with the salmon industry. I know that David had a relationship with salmon fishermen. And uh, Jason tells a funny story too about David coming home with fresh salmon and he sat at the table and he's like, fresh salmon again? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm digressing, but that's kind of what it was. I mean, we had all these wonderful products who really hadn't been commercialized yet. Mm -hmm. And now everybody knows, now you know, we have this fresh salmon and on the map and we have this wonderful Pinot Noir and we're known as a, you know, all around the world for a food and wine pairing from our wonderful resources here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. But in the 70s, they were never commercialized. Mm So what's next for you then after, after, after you write your second book? Um, I know you have a lot of other parts of the industry to come to, so what, what happens next? Well, I wrote a, uh, well, um, I wrote a third book <laughs> and um, I, I also taught as an adjunct at, at Linfield mm -hmm. in the wine program mm -hmm. and really enjoyed that. And I've written on and off for the Oregon Wine Press for several years. And I've been a wine judge at the uh, Astoria Seafood and Wine Festival. Let's, so let's talk about that part. You mentioned that earlier. 120 wines in six hours. <laughs> Tasting. How, <laughs> Not 120 glasses, right? How how did it come about, and, and what did you have to do to learn how to to be able to handle that kind of task? Well, I would say that I have a native um, a native education, um, organic education. Um, as it's organic as in the experience, not the, the um, technical mm -hmm. organic. Um, I basically was contacted by the uh, person who set the whole program up because they were looking for people who could um, 
who could really, uh, I don't know, have um, an unvarnished opinion. Um, so that it also had experience um, tasting wine. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So tell me about tell me about the sort of the discipline involved in that. What, what how do you taste that many wines in that amount of time and and differentiate? Oh, it's very structured. Differentiate between them. Well, you have components that you have to follow. You have to follow the same components in a very stringent way, for each for each wine. And you have your sheet of paper in front of you for each wine, and you judge them in five different categories: texture, you know, color. The first thing you do is you hold the wine glass up to the light and you look at the color. Um, and then you mouth feel texture you put it in your mouth and you sit around for not very long because you're really under the gun i mean you're like five seconds you gotta take it and you spit and um you you actually it's kind of trial by fire because you get you get very quickly you learn what is appealing and, and how to pick out the characteristics and very quickly you learn how to identify a flawed wine and it's like anything else, repetitive practice makes perfect. So, and again, I, I, my father was like this too. I really rely on my sense of smell. Some people are super tasters and some people are super smellers. I'm a super smeller. So I would go down, I'd have my glasses of five in front of me and I'll pick them up and I'll just smell them and barely taste them. So then I wouldn't even have to spit really, but I can, I can analyze the wine by my sense of smell. Um, more quickly almost than having to take a big taste or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So some pe people tend to be in one or the other category. You mentioned Linfield, of course. Tell me about your experience working with Linfield. I had a wonderful experience um, working with Linfield as an adjunct professor. With um, I was hired by Dr. Jones, and I enjoyed uh, working with the Wine Archive as well there. And um, the students I thought were outstanding. and very interested in the program. We did some wonderful field trips and I was always surprised by the, by the quality of their questions. Mm -hmm. And they weren't afraid to be inquisitive. And I, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed seeing the, the, the students, you know, just, they didn't really even seem like college students to me. They seemed older. <laughs> so, but maybe that's just a generational thing. I don't know, but I don't know. <laughs> anyway. And so you also have a blog, uh, Ben Wise, I believe, and uh, and 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 Dirt Vine Wine. Right. I have presumably. actually uh, I have a vlog called Wine Sisters Tears for Change. Okay. That I run with my friend who owns a wine store in Atlanta, and um, she's actually an African American woman who started this store and has now made it into the wine enthusiast for her. Um, contribution to the wine industry with this store and and she represents labels um, uh, from diverse wineries all over the world mm -hmm. and she and I started this vlog so we could give representation to um, people from diverse backgrounds in the industry whose stories might not be told as much as other ones in the mainstream media mm -hmm. so we've had a good time doing that And you're also, of course, working on a project more near and dear to you with the with the uh, the geezers. Tell us about the tell us about the oh geezers. the geezers. Tell us about yeah. the geezers first of all. Uh, yeah. And then tell us what you what the project is you're working on. Uh, so the geezers are um, my father and Jim McDaniel and Jim Marsh, uh, Dick Dickie Rath, uh, Gary Fuquay. Jerry Koschel, and um, Koschel's used to own, it was Crumbled Rock, and first it was Sosi, then it was Crumbled Rock, and now it's Furioso. Um, and um, John Davidson, Walnut City Wine Works, and Vivian Weber, Weber Vineyards. Uh, these are all people from my childhood, but they also all got together later in life and decided that they were gonna start a lunch club and they called themselves the self-named geezers. Vivian is the geezerette, the lone geezerette. <laughs> and uh, yeah, John's the geezer in waiting because mm -hmm. he's a little bit younger, so he's still waiting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but he's the geezer in waiting. And um, I started videotaping those things as well and documenting that because that became, is becoming, obviously those stories are really um, now becoming 
well, in, you know, they happened a while ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting it together in a mini documentary for him and I'm um, going to do some interesting things with that. And what else are you working on right now? I am now working back at the childhood winery that we founded, McDaniel Vineyards, which is now Tory Moore Winery. I am working in its 49th year to bring it into its 50th year celebration this whole year. I'm setting up the marketing campaign. We're going to have three new releases celebrating 50 years. Mm -hmm. So that has been a surreal experience. Um, and also a wonderful opportunity um, Dr. Olson offered to me to do this and um, it's really been delightful. So, you know, the, the vines that I planted, are, I have pictures of them now, are, you know, they're, you know, this big. Mm -hmm. And so that's fun. That's really gratifying to see that, gosh, you know, they live. Not only do they live, they're still one of the primary producers for the winery. Mm -hmm. So. So tell me, you mentioned a kind of a surreal experience going going back to that. What what is it like thinking about it being coming up on fifty years now and getting ready for that celebration? Well, unexpected. <laughs> um, I I um, I think I learned. I, I feel very lucky that I have the unique perspective of growing up on the vineyard and then having my parents sell it. Um, in my early 20s because I was forced to go develop myself um, in a bigger world context. So I can come back now to the vineyard at the age that I am and be grateful that I was able to develop myself in, you know, in other subject and other ways. So now I can come back to it and um, in a way, I get to come full circle, and and um, I get to come full circle, and and you don't often get to do that in life, where you get to go back in time, and and finish the story, so mm -hmm. to speak. I figure, I think this is for me. This is a way that I can finish that chapter in a rather glorious way, an exciting way too, because mm -hmm. it's fun. It's you know, I mean developing the labels for the three new releases with um, our winemakers, John Tomaselli, a very gifted winemaker. It was Jacques Tardy. Jacques Tardy was the winemaker before him. And then um, the first winemaker, when Donaldson bought it and turned it into Tory Moore, was Patricia Green. Mm -hmm. So as you know, so, and we've always made wonderful, they've always made wonderful high-end Pinot Noir from our graves that we planted in 1972. So now that I'm working with John to develop this new release that we're going to have for the 50-year celebration, that's just really, that's quite a gift. I feel like for me, that's, that's just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of complex emotions around that for me. So obviously, <laughs> but primarily, I think it's really exciting to enter the 50 club. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> never, you never know what life is going to throw you. But I do think that if you told me when I was a little girl at Dundee grade school that I would be back at the vineyard now, you know, married with three children and doing this, I never, I would have said you're crazy. Yeah. So one of the kind of the common themes it seems like for you is I mean, you've written about or covered or, or, or somehow documented the industry from, from, a, from a very early age. So I'm curious how sort of the writing and the documentation and the, and the video blogging, how has that helped keep you connected to the industry in general and especially to kind of the industry you grew up with? Oh, connected? Mm -hmm. uh, very connected because people like to share their stories, you know what I mean? <laughs> So, Just I mean, you me know, you have the same thing, yeah, and so, yeah, and, I, it's an, and I'm sure you feel the same way, and it's an honor to have people want to tell me their stories, and I go in the grocery store, I'd hear people talking about how did the wine industry start, and that's always been a big impetus for me, and it still is, because I don't want people to, many people still don't know you know, how it all started. And I don't want all of that hard work and dedication and challenge to just sort of disappear into the horizon and end up being a bottle of wine on the shelf at Fred Meyer without any backstory. Mm -hmm. So, particularly from, um, and I, I don't pretend to be the 
um, authoritarian on everything Oregon wine and the whole Oregon wine story. I only will take responsibility for my own stories on that little three mile stretch up the hill because that was my experience. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not pretending to be the scribe for the whole Oregon wine industry. I'm only talking about the Dundee Hills. Mm -hmm. But um, I, those stories are, are, they're getting up there. And mm -hmm. if I didn't document them, then they would disappear. Mm -hmm. But you're documenting at the Wine Archive too, so you make my life easier. <laughs> it's quite a challenge. Yeah. There's, a of, there's a lot of stories. There is a lot of stories, and and so all I have really, I mean, all I have to really be concerned with, I'm concerned with the greater world at large, obviously in the wine industry, but it's that little, you know, in the Dundee Hills, you have all of the, you know, much bigger, <laughs> much bigger industry to contend with. But I do want to point out too that for my Wine Sisters blog, we were just at, um, visiting with Jim Bernal, mm -hmm. the founder of Willamette Valley Vineyards. He was very gracious. He took my co-host Regina, who was visiting from Atlanta last weekend, and we went out to the vineyard and he took us out to the Willamette Valley Vineyards into the um, just showed us the whole winery up and down and he's got a new filtration blending machine and so this blending machine which is really the creation of many things um, it, it, you can you can actually blend the it's very complicated but anyway he showed it to me he's like this wonderful scientist visionary so inspirational to be around him for two hours so um, I get excited about where the industry is going too because he's expanding rapidly into mm -hmm. with other restaurants, as you know, mm -hmm. he, and and he has the um, sparkling facility that's going in here in Dundee, but he still manages to be. He gave um, my co-host Regina and I two hours of his time, manages to be gracious, and I think that's the earmark of the Oregon wine industry is there's still an authentic authenticity and an accessibility to the people who own the wineries. And I think that makes us unique. Hmm. And then Paige Knutson. Republishing your book of 50 years. Oh, yeah. And then, well, Paige Knutson also, she's another person who I was also with this weekend. And I'm just using these examples because it brings us more into the modern day of this discussion. And, and because I, I get um, like organ proud when I'm around these people. And because your Paige Knutson is, is coming back and. Hmm. Reinv reinvigorating the Knutson label after all of its iterations that you know from the beginning and um, there's there's a lot of momentum now in the wine industry that's very exciting to see along with the rapid growth of Oregon the wine industry is growing too sometimes for better or worse but you know mostly for the better and yes, yeah, so I'm writing the, uh, the along with the geezers, the mini documentary that I'm doing. I'm also reissuing Dirt Plus Wine Equals Wine 50 Year Edition nice. for the holidays. So, and adding things like I just talked about with that too, with the you know Jim Bernal, who really is this visionary who's taking Oregon wine to a whole nother level with being in the Vancouver waterfront. He's going to be in um, that state of the art development that's in Washington and some other places too that is expanding. Mm -hmm. And I just think there's a lot of interesting things that are happening right now mm -hmm. that, are, that are really building on the last 50 years. When it comes to, you mentioned earlier that the, the kind of idea of, of all, all the stories the behind the bottle that can kind of disappear when the bottle's just on, on a shelf in a grocery store and wanting to preserve that, I'm curious, what is it, a, to you, in your opinion, what is it about wine that begs for the story versus other products that you find on a shelf? Why, why does wine need that story so much? Why, and why does it resonate with people so much when, they, when they're buying wine or when they're meeting, meeting people in the industry? I think it resonates with people because they feel like they can be part of the story. When they, when they bring that bottle of wine home, they're bringing home their little piece of the Yola Hills AVA, or they're bringing home that little piece of the Dundee Hills, you know? Um, there's there's a connection um, that people can have an immediate connection and then wine is also a con it's a connector it's a universal connector with food and wine at dinner uh, it, it's a unique product like that 
So we talked a little bit about the industry already, kind of what, the exciting things going on now. Uh, obviously, the last couple of years have been a challenge in a number of ways with with the pandemic and and with uh, with a very rough vintage in 2020. Tell me about that as as you kind of saw the last couple of years and, and how the how the industry is going is coming out of it and will come out of it. Well, luckily. This most recent vintage that just happened, this most recent harvest was the the fruit was beautiful, so that that was helpful. Um, at the vintage before, obviously there was challenges, many challenges. Um, not to mention, yes, we had the pandemic last year and wildfires and. Um, I think that the industry has gone through challenges up and down for a long time. And I think this is only another another challenge to overcome. I think that the Oregon wine industry is resilient. I think it is the path, uh, you, you know, it, we're all flowing in the river and the river is constant. So there is no stopping and um, just saying this is all like, why isn't this like the good old days? We're permanently altered by the effects of the pandemic and probably we are now in what is the new normal for people to visit tasting rooms and things like that. So what we have seen that's positive or well that's interesting is virtual tastings online. That was a big component of last year's business model for Oregon wineries, although People are getting tired of doing that now, and now they're happy after the vaccination that they can actually visit the wineries again. So that's made a big difference. However, the, there is still a limit on the number of crowds, the number of people that you can have in the facility. So uh, these resilient winery owners have, you know, developed outside tasting areas that they'll probably always have now. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's been. And I, for one, like to be outside and like to have that experience outside and the wine tasting experience. And I think that's been a positive thing for the public, too. I, I think it's a, you, you can be outside and you can look at the view. And I don't think that we're ever going to go 100% back to cramming a bunch of people in the room and not even having any outside access. Yeah. I think it's permanently changed. People are making investments and having big outside tasting areas so and heat lamps and lighting and whatever it takes. So, I mean, for better or worse, we're, we're, we are moving on and surviving and learning to thrive. And, you know, whether it's natural elements that are really, that are a challenge or whether it's um, societal elements that are a challenge, that's any industry is going to have to deal with that, especially agricultural industry, which is driven by, you know, the natural elements. Um, that's life, you know, you get the wonderful and the awful all at the same time. <laughs> and you just try to do the wonderful things with it and, and um, navigate the awful. Mm -hmm. Uh, you used the word resilient there I, I, when we talk about winery owners, and I appreciate that your perspective on kind of resilience in the industry. So from that, as we're getting into, a, like you say, a new normal, what, what does the industry look like? What, what do you foresee for the future in, in Oregon wine in, in, in the upcoming years? Well, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I, I'm not a magic. I, I don't know. I don't know why. I, I think what my eight ball says is, um, I think, I think the Oregon wine industry is poised to be on the national and international market, like it ha I think we're poised now to attract the marketplace people from all over the world because there are these natural disasters happening all over the world and there are issues in different places all over the world and people want to come to our own little piece of paradise. And so the Oregon wine industry is going to benefit from that. Um, Because uh, you know we have a unique environment and um, a very pretty um, because of the earth urban growth boundary we preserved um, these wonderful the wonderful land for vineyards and things like that and it's very unique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although that was also a very disputed topic in the 70s, but 
Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> and then Tom McCall, our governor, also the governor who created public beaches in Oregon, started that trend. So now people can come and they can go any part of the Oregon beach. It's all public property. And they can come to these and see people's vineyards that are in the hill. I mean, and so there's some very unique components about Oregon that attract people. Now, it might not be the beach that you would recline on and expect 95 degree weather, but it, it has its own beauty. <laughs> you can always warm up with a glass of Pinot Noir, right? That's a good way to sell wine. I appreciate that. So what about for yourself as you look at, obviously you're working on a lot of different projects right now. What, what comes next for you? Well, I really am developing the Geezer's video. I'm interested in, in um, doing more video. I, I think the way of the future in journalism is to, co is to um, you know, sort of uh, embrace video and, and technology that way and in, in a way of telling the story. It's not just the printed word anymore. I am also writing about um, being an entrepreneur, and I'm interested in, in, I'm a professional speaker, and I, I talk to groups of people about um, entrepreneurship, challenges with entrepreneurship, particularly female entrepreneurship. So, and then in the meantime, I have nine chickens, <laughs> and a year old Labrador puppy, and uh, two cats, and, um, you know, and I'm enjoying being part of my children's lives as they grow up, and um, I just feel very lucky to be here. Well, and I'm going to keep writing for the rest of my life, one way or another. So. Of course. You mentioned the uh, entrepreneurship. I'm curious about it. Tell me, tell me about a little bit about that, about speaking about that, and what 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 sort of your goal with that. Well, that was my third book, actually, which is intertwined, and it was called Intertwined: Grief, Gratitude, and Growing a, Growing a Business. So, um, I also had a near death experience. Um, yeah, in the middle of all of this, um, that was the impetus for writing that, and then it was. Um, Anyway, so I wrote about that experience and it made me think about also in that experience with the book um, about being an entrepreneur at this time of my life. And I, I just, I have always been a native entrepreneur. I didn't even know what that word meant when I started doing my own thing, so to speak. Um, and there's challenges with that that I wanted to help support other people and, mm -hmm. um, Anyway, it's become a business model, and people are interested in how they can um, develop their own entrepreneurial skills. And everybody wants to hear about mistake, how you made your mistakes and how they can learn from them. So I'm more than happy to share my mistakes. And I'm certainly not, not everybody makes mistakes, but those are some of the richest learning opportunities. You know, my parents taught me that. So, um, and I think that the Oregon wine industry, too, in and of itself, is a very entrepreneurial group of people. I mean... A lot of interesting mistakes. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, that became, you know, what, what was one mistake became, you know, sometimes a good bottle of wine. <laughs> so you never know, you know. So you have, a, you have a pretty unique perspective on the industry. So the last question I want to ask you is about, about sort of change. And we talked about change quite a bit. But from the industry that you grew up with and, are, and, and to, to now, obviously it's, it's grown in every conceivable way. But right. what, are, what are the through lines that you've seen that, that still exist from, from then? And what, what are the biggest changes? Um. What are the, what are the, the what, what, what's, what's sta what has stayed consistent from, from then or stayed, stayed somewhat the same and, and what are the biggest changes to the industry that, that, that you've seen? I think what stayed consistent is the passion for um, the passion for growing not only Pinot Noir but really the passion for growing grapes in Oregon um, because we're all still around the people are still around from those first finds in the ground, including my family, who were told it couldn't be done. And I think there's still a lot of, I wouldn't say defiance, but I mean, I think there's still a lot of pride in ownership that it is being done for 50, has been done for 50 years. Um, 
so, and I was going to say something else too, but I don't remember what it was. Anyway, I, there's, there's um, the other component that I think is happening is, uh, for instance, the Ponzi sold to Bollinger, the French Champagne House, which I see, and I was mentioning, I think Jim Bernal was doing exciting things with Willamette Valley Vineyards being one of the first publicly traded wineries in the world, and Paige Knutes and revitalizing what was, um, and still is, one of the largest vineyards in Oregon. And now we have the Ponzi selling to Bollinger, which, you know, also makes me so proud of them and um, the industry that we have attracted the attention of this internationally famous wine, you know, family, the Bollinger family, and now they're operating it, and Louisa Ponzi is still the winemaker. And so all of that effort and all of those years that people made putting, that people spent putting into growing those grapes, that's pretty big, that's a pretty big kudos for the industry to have attracted Bollinger. And the same when Robert Drahan came, although nobody really believed it was him for a while. <laughs> so, but it was, obviously. And um, so it'll be interesting to see what's next. Because I don't think Bollinger will be the last. And they've expressed willingness, the dynamic wonderful thing about that is they've expressed willingness to uh, keep the authenticity of, and the Ponzi family vision very authentic. So, with obviously Louisa being the winemaker, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, that's wonderful. That's the best, that's the best case scenario in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. but. It speaks to what you mentioned earlier about Oregon having a place internationally now. Yeah. That that, that that kind of thing can happen. Right. On a, on a, yeah, and Druhan definitely was our first international player, um, but I, I think Bollinger is just a larger entity as well, so it's yeah. interesting to see what will be next. Mm -hmm. So, so there you go. Well, that's all the questions that I have for you. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here today that we should have covered? I think we pretty much covered it. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, My and as always, and your stories, and your hospitality, and your memories, and all of that. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Rich.